Chapter 5, Parts 3, 4, and 5 of A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Graham Redman. A History of Greece to the Death of Alexander the Great, Volume 1, by John Bagnall Bury, Chapter 5, Part 3. Growth of Sparta and the Peloponnesian League While a tyrant was moulding the destinies of Athens, the growth of the Spartan power had changed the political aspect of the Peloponnesus. About the middle of the 6th century, Sparta won successes against her northern neighbours, Tegea and Argos, and in consequence of these successes she became the predominant power in the peninsula. Eastern Arcadia is marked by a large plain, high above the sea level. The villages in the north of this plain had coalesced into the town of Mantinea, those in the south had been united in Tegea. Sparta had gradually pressed up to the borders of the Tegean territory, and a long war was the result. This war is associated with an interesting legend based on the tradition that the Laconian hero Orestes was buried in Tegea. When the Spartans asked the Delphic oracle whether they might hope to achieve the conquest of Arcadia, they received a promise that the god would give them Tegea. Then, on account of this answer, they went forth against Tegea with fetters, but were defeated, and bound in the fetters which they had brought to bind the Tegeates were compelled to till the Tegean plain. Herodotus professed that in his day the very fetters hung in the temple of Athena Alia, the protectress of Tegea. War went on, and the Spartans, invariably defeated, at last consulted the oracle again. The god bade them bring back the bones of Orestes, but they could find no trace of the hero's burying place, and they asked the god once more. This time they received an oracle couched in obscure, enigmatic words. Among Arcadian hills a level space holds to jeer where blow two blasts perforce, and woe is laid on woe, and face to face, striker and counter-striker, there the course thou seekest lies, even Agamemnon's son. Convey him home, and victory is won. This did not help them much, but it befell that, during a truce with the Tegeates, a certain Lycas, a Spartan man, was in Tegea, and entering a smith's shop, saw the process of beating out iron. The smith, in conversation, told him that, wishing to dig a well in his courtyard, he had found a coffin seven cubits long, and within it a corpse of the same length, which he replaced. Lycas guessed at once that he had won the solution of the oracular enigma, and, returning to Sparta, communicated his discovery. The courtyard was hired from the reluctant smith, the coffin was found, and the bones brought home to Laconia. Then Tegea was conquered, and here we return from fable to fact. The territory of the Arcadian city was not treated like Messenia, it was not incorporated in the territory of Lacedaemon. It became a dependent state, contributing a military contingent to the army of its conqueror, and it bound itself to harbour no Messenians within its borders. At this period the councils of Sparta seem to have been guided by Chilon, whose name became proverbial for wisdom. It was much about the same time, perhaps shortly after the victory over Tegea, that Sparta at length succeeded in rounding off the frontier of Laconia on the northeastern side, by wresting the disputed territory of Thyreatis from Argos. The armies of the two states met in the marchland, but the Spartan kings and the Argive chiefs agreed to decide the dispute by a combat between three hundred chosen champions on either side. The story is that all the six hundred were slain except three, one Spartan and two Argives, and that while the Argives hurried home to announce their victory, the Spartan, Othryades was his name, remained on the field and erected a trophy. 
In any case, the trial was futile, for both parties claimed the victory, and a battle was fought in which the Argives were utterly defeated. Thyreatis was the last territorial acquisition of Sparta. She changed her policy, and instead of aiming at gaining new territory, she endeavoured to make the whole Peloponnesus a sphere of Lacedaemonian influence. This change of policy was exhibited in her dealing with Tegea. The defeat of Argos placed Sparta at the head of the peninsula. All the Peloponnesian states except Argos and Achaea were enrolled in a loose confederacy, engaging themselves to supply military contingents in the common interest, Lacedaemon being the leader. The meetings of the Confederacy were held at Sparta, and each member sent representatives. Corinth readily joined, for Corinth was naturally ranged against Argos, while her commercial rival, the island state of Aegina, was a friend of Argos. Periander had already inflicted a blow upon the Argives by seizing Epidorus and thus cutting off their nearest communications with Aegina. The other Isthmian state, Megara, in which the rule of the nobles had been restored, was also enrolled. Everywhere Sparta exerted her influence to maintain oligarchy. Everywhere she discountenanced democracy, so that her supremacy had important consequences for the constitutional development of the Peloponnesian states. In northern Greece the power of the Thessalians was declining, and thus Sparta became the strongest state in Greece in the second half of the sixth century. She was on the most friendly terms with Athens throughout the reign of Pisistratus, but the tyrant was careful to maintain good relations with Argos also. With Argos herself, indeed, Athens had no cause for collision, but the rivalry which existed between Athens and Aegina naturally ranged Athens and Argos in opposite camps. It was perhaps not long before the accession of Pisistratus that the Athenians had landed forces in Aegina and had been repulsed with Argive help. The policy of Pisistratus avoided a conflict with his island neighbour and courted the friendship of Argos but the deeper antagonism is shown by the embargo which Argos and Aegina placed upon the importation of Attic pottery. The excavations of the temple of the Argive Hera have illustrated this hostile measure. Hardly any fragments of Attic pottery dating from the period of Pisistratus or fifty years after his death have been found in the precinct. End of chapter 5, part 3 Chapter 5, Part 4, Fall of the Pisistratids and Intervention of Sparta When Pisistratus died, his eldest son Hippias took his place. Hipparchus helped him in the government, while Thessalus took little or no share in politics. The general policy of Pisistratus, both in home and foreign affairs, was continued but the court of Athens seems to have acquired a more distinctive literary flavour. Hippias, who was a learned student of oracles, and Hipparchus were abreast of the most modern culture. The eminent poets of the day came to their court. Simonides of Sios, famous for his choral odes, Anacreon of Teos, boon companion, singer of wine and love, Lasus of Hermione, who made his mark by novelties in the treatment of the dithyram, and amused his leisure hours by composing hissless hymns, in which the sound S did not occur. All these were invited or welcomed by Hipparchus. One of the most prominent figures in this society was Onomacritus, a religious teacher, who took part in preparing the new edition of Homer. The first serious blow aimed at the power of the tyrants was due to a personal grudge, not to any widespread dissatisfaction, but nevertheless it produced a series of effects which resulted in the fall of the tyranny. It would seem, but conflicting accounts of the affair were in circulation, that Hipparchus, or according to another story Thessalus, gave offence to a comely young man named Harmodius and his lover Aristogiton. It is said that Hipparchus was in love with Harmodius, and, when his wooing was rejected, avenged himself by putting a slight on the youth's sister, 
refusing to allow her to bear a basket in the Panathenaic procession. Harmodius and Aristogiton then formed the plan of slaying the tyrants, and chose the day of that procession because they could then, without raising suspicion, appear publicly with arms. Very few were initiated in the plot, as it was expected that when the first blow was struck the citizens would declare themselves for freedom. But as the hour approached, it was observed that one of the conspirators was engaged in speech with Hippias in the outer Ceramicus. His fellows leapt hastily to the conclusion that their plot was betrayed, and, giving up the idea of attacking Hippias, rushed to the market-place and slew Hipparchus near the Leocorion. Harmodius was cut down by the mercenaries, and Aristogiton, escaping for the moment, was afterwards captured, tortured, and put to death. At the time no sympathy was manifested, perhaps little felt for the conspirators. But their act led to a complete change in the government of Hippias. Not knowing what ramifications the plot might have, or what dangers might still lurk about his feet, he became a hard and suspicious despot. He fortified Menicia to have a post on the shore from which he might at any hour flee overseas, and he began to turn his eyes towards Persia, where a new power had begun to cast its shadow over the Hellenic world. Then many Athenians came to hate him, and longed to shake off the reins of tyranny, and they began to cherish the memory of Harmodius and Aristogiton as tyrant-slayers. The overthrow of the tyranny was chiefly brought about by the Alcmeonids, who desired to return to Athens, and could not win their desire so long as the Pisistratids were in power. They had taken care to cultivate an intimacy with the priesthood of Delphi, which they now turned to account. The old sanctuary of Apollo had been burned down by a mischance, and it was resolved to build a new temple at an enormous cost. Footnote. Three hundred talents, perhaps one hundred thousand pounds, which, in those days when money was scarce and the fortunes of the richest were small, would correspond to six or seven times as much nowadays. End of footnote. A Panhellenic subscription was organized, and by this means about a quarter of the needed money was raised. The rest was defrayed from the resources of Delphi. The Alcmeonids undertook the contract for the work, and the story went that a frontage of Parian marble was added at their own expense, porous stone having been specified in the agreement. The temple was not unworthy of the greatest shrine of Hellas. An Athenian poet has sung of the glancing light of the two fair faces of the pillared house of Loxias, and has vividly described sculptured metopes with heroes destroying monsters, and a pediment with the gods quelling the giants. Footnote. Euripides in the Ion, line 185 at sequentes. End of footnote. It must have been about the time when the new temple was approaching its completion, or soon after, that to the holy buildings of Delphi was added one of the richest of all. The islanders of Siphnos spent some of the wealth which they dug out of their gold mines in making themselves a treasury at the mid-centre of the earth, and its remains recently recovered show us the richness of its decoration. Perhaps this building marks the height of Siphnian prosperity. Before a hundred years had passed their supply of precious metal was withdrawn. Their miners had got below the sea level, and the water filtering in cut them off from the sources of their wealth. Large sums of money passed through the hands of the Alcmeonids during the building of the temple, and their enemies said that this enabled them to hire mercenaries for their design on Attica. Their first attempt was a failure. They and other exiles seize Lipsidrian, a strong position on a spur of Mount Parnes, looking down on Pianidi and Arcani, but they were too few to take the field by themselves, and the people had no desire to drive out the tyrant for the sake of setting up an oligarchy of nobles. They were soon forced to abandon their fortress and leave Attica. 
Convinced that they could only accomplish their schemes by foreign help, they used their influence with the Delphic Oracle to put pressure on Sparta. Accordingly, whenever the Spartans sent to consult the god, the response always was, First free Athens! It has already been said that the Pisistratids cultivated the friendship of Sparta, and after his brother's murder Hippias was more anxious than ever not to break with her. But the diplomacy of the Alcmeonids, of whose clan Cleisthenes, son of Megacles, was at this time head, supported as it was by the influence of Delphi, finally prevailed, and the Spartans consented to force freedom upon Athens. Perhaps they thought the dealings of Hippias with Persia suspicious. He had married his daughter, Archidice, to a son of the tyrant of Lampsacus, who was known to have influence at the Persian court. A first expedition of the Spartans under Anchimolius was utterly routed with the help of a body of Thessalian cavalry, but a second, led by King Cleomenes, defeated the Thessalians, and Hippias was blockaded in the Acropolis. When his children, whom he was sending secretly into safety abroad, fell into the hands of his enemies, he capitulated, and, on condition that they were given back, undertook to leave Attica within five days. He and all his house departed to Sigeum, and a pillar was set up on the Acropolis, recording the sentence which condemned the Pisistratids to perpetual disfranchisement, Atimia. Thus the tyrants had fallen, and with the aid of Sparta, Athens was free. It was not surprising that when she came to value her liberty, she loved to turn away from the circumstances in which it was actually won, and linger over the romantic attempt of Harmodius and Aristogiton, which might be considered at least the prelude to the fall of Hippias. A drinking song, breathing the spirit of liberty, celebrated the two friends who slew the tyrant. Harmodius and Aristogiton became household words. A skilful sculptor, Antina, wrought a commemorative group of the two tyrant slayers, and it was set up not very many years later above the marketplace. The Athenian Republic had to pay, indeed, something for its deliverance. It was obliged to enter into the Peloponnesian League, of which Sparta was the head, and thus Sparta acquired a certain right of interference in the affairs of Athens. This new obligation was destined to lead soon to another struggle. End of chapter 5, part 4 Chapter 5, part 5 King Cleomenes and the Second Spartan Intervention It is necessary here to digress for a moment to tell of the strange manner of the birth of King Cleomenes who liberated Athens. His father, King Anaxandridas, was wedded to his niece, but she had no children. The ephors, heedful that the royal family of the aged should not die out, urged him to put her away, and when he gainsaid, they insisted that he should take a second wife into his house. This he did, and Cleomenes was born. But soon afterwards his first wife, hitherto childless, bore a son who was named Dorius. When the old king died, it was ruled that Cleomenes as the eldest should succeed, and Dorius, who had looked forward to the kingship, was forced to leave Sparta. He went forth to seek his fortune in lands beyond the sea. Having attempted to plant a settlement in Libya, he led an expedition of adventure to the west. He took part in a war of Croton with Sybaris, and then fared to Sicily, with the design of founding a new city in the southwest country, yet he did not bring his purpose to pass, for he fell in a battle against the Carthaginians and their Illimian allies. It must also be told that after the birth of Dorius, his mother brought Anaxandridas two other sons, Leonidas and Cleombrotus, both of whom we shall meet hereafter. After the expulsion of the tyrant, the Athenians had to deal with the political problems whose solution fifty years before had been postponed by the tyranny. The main problem was to modify the constitution of Solon in such a way as to render it practicable. 
The old evils which had hindered the realization of Solon's democracy reared their heads again as soon as Hippias had been driven out and the Spartans had departed. The strife of factions led by noble and influential families broke out, and the coast and plain seem to have risen again in the parties of the Alcmeonid Cleisthenes and his rival Isagoras. As Cleisthenes had been the most active promoter of the revolution, Isagoras was naturally supported by the secret adherents of the tyrant's house. The struggle at first turned in favour of Isagoras, who was elected to the chief magistracy, but it was only for a moment. Cleisthenes won the upper hand by enlisting on his side superior numbers. He rallied to his cause a host of poor men who were outside the pale of citizenship by promising to make them citizens. Thus the victory of Cleisthenes, and the victory of Cleisthenes was the victory of reform, was won by the threat of physical force. And in the year of his rival's archonship, he introduced new democratic measures of law. Isagoras was so far outnumbered that he had no recourse but appeal to Sparta. At his instance, the Lacedaemonians, who looked with disfavour on democracy, demanded that the Alcmeonids, as a clan under a curse, should be expelled from Attica, and Cleisthenes, without attempting resistance, left the country. But this was not enough. King Cleomenes entered Attica for the second time. He expelled seven hundred families pointed out by Isagoras, and attempted to dissolve the new constitution and to set up an oligarchy. But the whole people rose in arms. Cleomenes, who had only a small band of soldiers with him, was blockaded with Isagoras in the Acropolis, and was forced to capitulate on the third day, in spite of his Spartan spirit. Footnote. Homo's Laconicon Pneon. Aristophanes Lysistrata, line 276. End of footnote. Cleisthenes could now return with all the other exiles and complete his work. The event was a check for Lacedaemon. It was the first, but it was not the last, time that Athenian oligarchs sought Spartan intervention, and Spartan men-at-arms held the hill of Athena. End of chapter 5, part 5 Recording by Graham Redmond